Well, good morning, Tiffany Fellowship Church. How is everyone in the house today? We also want to say a special thank you and welcome to those of you who are joining us online this morning via stream. We're thrilled you're here too. You're just as much a part of us as those in the house. And so even though we miss your face, we know you're there and we appreciate hearing from you. Let me just say one quick important thing before I get into the message this morning. Faith Promise Cards. We received a message this last week from headquarters, the AGWM, Assembly of God World Missions headquarters. We received a letter uh, uh, addressed to me uh, from the head of the World, World Missions office saying, thank you, Pastor Barry and Tiffany Fellowship Church. Said you are one of only 5% of all Assembly of God churches in the country who have given more to missions in 2020 than in 2019. I was blown away. I was blown away. I was so blown away by that. This letter, and maybe I'll read it to you next Sunday, but said that most Assembly of God churches have cut back on their missions giving, have had to cut back because of the COVID, and that's required the uh, the missions endeavor of the assemblies have got to cut its budget, and that should not be the case. Um, and so I'm thrilled, and it's only by the generosity of this congregation who God is blessing in the midst of this crisis. We are given as much and more to missions, and I'm so proud of you and wanted to say that, uh, how proud I am of you. And remind you that next Sunday is Faith Promise Sunday. What, you get one of these cards. We can't pass them out. But they're back at the uh, giving stations, and they're back at the uh, information booth, guest services desk. We need your pledge for this year. I believe God's going to bless us tremendously for, because of your generosity and faithfulness. And we believe that God's going to bless you for your giving, and we believe that he already has. And so we're thrilled by that. Are you ready for the Word of God today? If you have your Bibles... Please turn to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Occasionally, very rarely, because I don't don't want you to get cramps in your fingers. Those of you using a traditional Bible, those of you using a smartphone, we're going to have two texts this morning. We're going to read in a moment. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and Acts chapter 5, verse 27 through 29. So if you go to both of those texts, we're going to read those both this morning. I just want to ask the sound person, thank you, Danny, for your great work you do. Could you turn me down a little bit? Because I feel like I'm going to get emphatic today, and I don't want to break any eardrums. If I get, if, you know, if I get to shouting, I won't want to pierce anybody's eardrums. Okay. Today I conclude the series, Cancel Culture. In this series, we have been looking at the dangers of the mob mentality endemic in this culture. Damon Linker, writing for the online magazine called The Week, defines cancel culture this way. He writes, and I quote, a small number of online progressives have appointed themselves a moral vanguard, upholding and attempting to enforce through the methods of a digital mob, a form of puritanical egalitarianism that is... uh, is affirmed only by a very few. Any writer, entertainer, or other public personality who diverges from this moral standard by demonstrating insufficient sensitivity and deference to the feelings of members of certain protected classes will find himself canceled, unquote. And I would add that with no hope of redemption or restoration, the canceled party is left permanently in its shame and disgrace. And a final question I have is this. Who is this small number of progressives who have appointed themselves a moral vanguard? And who are these elites who set a moral standard to which we all are forced to conform? And what is the standard for who who constitutes the protected class. The fact is, our culture is cancel crazy. 
cancel crazy and cancel happy. The Democrats are trying to cancel the Republicans. The conservatives are trying to cancel the progressive liberals. The politically correct are trying to cancel the politically incorrect. There's no debate. There's no discussion. There's no discord. There's only shame that is being projected on those who disagree with us. We are no longer a two-party system of government in our country divided by an aisle. We are polarized arch enemies devoted to annihilating each other. What are we going to do if our enemies are in control of our government? And how can we live under the oppression of a cancel culture government? That's what we're going to talk about today. So if you'd stand with me, please, let's read our scripture text. And would you pardon me while I come down here and turn the volume down on my iPad? (laughs) Sorry about that. Try to stay connected with our online audience, but can't have two Barry Clares talking at us at once. That's just way, one, one too many Barry Clares, really. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to, uh, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And this, is why also, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone that you, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Turning over to Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 29. Scripture says, The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. This is God's word. Can you affirm it? Thank you, Lord, for your word. Speak to us through it. Confront us by it. Inspire us with it. We open our hearts to obey your word and not just listen to it only. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The title of today's message is Supreme Authority. Supreme Authority. Before I get into the meat of this message, let me just say something. I debated whether to say this or not. I'm just going to say it. Occasionally, God will give me a message that I just can't stand to preach. I want to tell you one of the greatest things in all the world is the privilege and the honor and the calling of God to preach the gospel from this pulpit. And I do not take it lightly. And I love it. I love preaching God's word and I love affirming the gospel to you. But sometimes God gives a message, a hard message, a message that I fear to bring and a message I do not want to bring. And can I just tell you, I struggled with this message all week long, all week long. And finally, I submitted (laughs) to the Holy Spirit. And so I present this message to you this morning. I only say that to say it is with fear and trembling that I present this message to you this morning. There seems to be a tension in the text. Did you hear the tension in the text? Did you, 
did you see the apparent disagreement in the Word of God? Paul says in our text, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7, that we are to obey the governing authorities, submit to them. And yet, the apostles Peter and John told the governing authorities that they would not obey them. There's a tension there. There seems to be a problem there. We're not talking about peaceful protest here. We're talking about civil disobedience. The fact that Peter and John said, we won't obey you, those of you who are governing authorities, when you tell us not to preach the gospel, it was that declaration, we will obey God and not man, that got both of these men persecuted for their faith. Peter, according to tradition, was crucified upside down. We're not sure how John died, but we do know that tradition tells us that he was immersed in a boiling vat of oil because he would not be silent. He preached even though he was told not to. We're not talking about peaceful protests here. We're talking about civil disobedience. And I wonder, is that ever appropriate? When and how is it appropriate? And how do we reconcile this tension, this apparent tension represented in these two texts how can we live godly in this tension and how can this make sense to us and that's really the purpose of this message this morning so for the next few minutes i just want to present kind of two overarching points this morning first i want to talk about some principles of biblical civil disobedience some principles of biblical civil disobedience. My list, the list that I present to you today is by no means exhaustive, but I want to give you some principles from Scripture that should guide our convictions concerning this concept of civil disobedience. There are a couple of churches out in California who this morning are practicing civil disobedience because the governor has said that inside services should not take place, and some pastors are saying, We serve God, and we will obey God rather than man, and so we're going to have services despite what the government said. They're practicing civil disobedience this morning. I thank God that in Missouri, we are not mandated to make that choice. We can sing here. (laughs) We can sing in Missouri. (laughs) How do we do this? What are some principles from the scripture that should guide our convictions concerning civil disobedience. So let me give you some. Again, not necessarily exhaustive, but let me just hit the high points here. Number one, the first, I think, principle that should guide our convictions concerning biblical civil disobedience is that God is the supreme authority. Government is a subordinate authority. First thing we need to understand about this whole concept Let's get the authority uh, structure straight. God is the supreme authority. Government is a subordinate authority. Our text clearly outlines the authority flow. God is the highest and all other authority is subordinate to his. In fact, our text says in verse 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And, And here it is. Here it is, the crucial part. For there is No authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. In other words, all authority, let me just say it, authority in the home, authority in the culture, authority in in the government, all authority, it it has been has been established by God. God is the author of the system by which we are. Governed, he has ordained and established that authority structure should exist. Paul here is not saying that all authority is equal authority. Look at the text closely. You will see that Paul is saying God has established that nations should be governed by laws and leaders, but he is the one from whom all authority flows. John chapter 19, verse 11. Look it up and study it at home. Jesus told Pilate when he was on trial that resulted in his life being 
forfeited and being crucified on a cross, he told Pilate, the authority that you have was given from above. In other words, God gave governmental authorities the power they have, and they are accountable to him. They are accountable to him. Now, if we were to say that to our governing officials today, they would laugh at us, they would mock us, and they would try to cancel us. I love how Dr. Matthew Hall of Southern Seminary puts it, and I quote, Christians have a responsibility to honor God and the emperor, but we mustn't get the order confused. Our supreme allegiance, our supreme loyalty, our supreme identity is to the creator and the ruler of the universe, unquote. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Numero uno, number one. In Mark chapter 12, verse 17, we'll put on the multimedia display. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. And what Jesus is saying is you owe government a lot, but you owe God more. You owe government a lot. You owe government your allegiance and your support and your submission and your obedience, but you owe God more. That's the first principle that should guide our convictions. Secondly, the default mode or the norm of every believer should be to obey the governing authorities. That's what our text says, and that's what Scripture says over and over again. I find it interesting that Peter himself, the one who said, we're not going to obey you governing authorities that tell us not to preach the gospel, we're not going to obey you, he even says in his epistles, we're to obey and respect the emperor and the king. (laughs) Why? Because the default mode or the norm of every believer should be to obey the governing authorities. Look at verse 2 and verse 4 of our text this morning. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Verse 4, for the, one who, uh, the, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. There's benefits, there's goodness that comes to you when you submit to the God-ordained authority. And the fact is we obey many, many, many more laws than we will ever disobey, right? We'll obey much more laws than we'll ever disobey. The law exists for our good. It protects us. It helps us. It it, it brings order and safety and security to society. And since God established that people would be governed by laws and leaders, it should be the default mode or the norm to submit to the authority that God has established. One more thing before I go on to number three. People who routinely rebel against laws and leaders usually have an authority problem. People who routinely rebel against laws and leaders usually have an authority problem. Think about it. (laughs) The norm, the default mode of every believer should be obedience and submission. Number three, the third conviction that should guide the third principle that should guide our convictions concerning civil disobedience is that three, rarely a subordinate authority will institute a law against God's supreme law. Those commands must be nonviolently disobeyed. Let me say that again. Rarely a subordinate authority will institute a law against God's supreme law. Those commands must be nonviolently disobeyed. Now, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here, but let me say this. I'll look you right in the eye and say this. You must never blindly trust and obey everything your government says. Now, I know this flies in the face of what some people believe by way of their conviction. 
And I will affirm that I, uh, I will obey 95, maybe 99% of my government's laws. But when it comes, when the government commands that I violate a law of God, I must disobey. I must disobey. Do you know what the number one reason during the uh, war trials at Nuremberg of the World War II of the SS and the Nazi commander, the number one defense that they gave for killing and genocide against the Jewish people, and the number one reason, we were ordered to do it. Government told us to. And yet many, most, lost their lives because they obeyed an unlawful command by their government. Let me give you some, very quickly, let me give you some biblical precedents for civil disobedience. There are a lot of them. I'm just going to highlight four. Four biblical precedents for civil, civil disobedience. Number one, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to read, the, I'm not going to put the scripture on the screen, but I'm going to read, read it, write down the reference and study it. Number one, the apostles disobediently preached the gospel. Acts 5, 27 through 29, our text, the apostles were brought in, made you appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Number one, the apostles disobediently preached the gospel. Number two, midwives disobeyed Pharaoh's command to kill Hebrew boys. Jewish Hebrew midwives disobeyed Pharaoh's command to kill Hebrew boys. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17 and verse 21. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And because, verse 21, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. And by the way, let me just say, go back and read this text for yourself. You will find that they lied to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh said, why, why did you let the boys live? They said, well, Jewish women are sturdy women, and they just gave birth too fast, and it all happened so fast, we couldn't kill them fast enough time. They lied. And God blessed them anyway. Oh, what? Just let that sit with you for a while. <laughs> Third, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to worship an idol. They refused. In Daniel chapter 3, verses 6 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Listen to this. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We will not. In pain of death. We would rather die. Whoa. Number four. Daniel disobediently prayed. Daniel chapter 6, verse 13, you'll recall. Nebuchadnezzar said, you can't pray to any God. You can't pray to anyone but me. I'm the big, I'm the big, big honcho, and you can't pray to anyone. Look what Daniel chapter 6, verse 13 says. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to your, your majesty, nor to your decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And in fact, the Bible says that Daniel went to the window that faced Jerusalem, and right in front of everybody who could see through the window, he prayed three times a day, disobediently. Sybil disobedient. See, the problem, listen, the problem with cancel culture is that it acts and operates as if it is the supreme authority. It's trying to, uh, we have to be careful because 
the cancel culture, it's trying to cancel the church, God's law, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Great Commission must not be canceled. We must obey God rather than man. Cancel culture would say it's wrong to compel. It's wrong to, to, to encourage people from other countries to serve our God. They, want to, they would want to cancel us for that. Listen to me, friends. Civil de- disobedience, <laughs> it takes a lot of discernment and prayerful consideration and should never be done impulsively or quickly. This is something, let me just say this, I want to speak prophetically right now. This is something we need to be praying about right now. At what point are we going to get to that tipping point where we say, cannot do it. Number four, the fourth principle that should guide our convictions concerning civil disobedience, there is no biblical precedent for disobedience due to the denial of personal freedoms. Let me say this again, because this will be tough for most of us, maybe in this room, to get There is no biblical precedent for disobedience due to the denial of personal freedoms. See, there are are biblical boundaries on civil disobedience. Now listen, you're you're free, and you're an American, and you have certain rights, and if you choose to disobey the government, that's fine, because it infringes on your personal freedoms, but don't do, listen, don't do it in the name of God. Don't lift up the Bible and say, the Bible says I don't have to wear a mask. No. I cannot find any Bible verse that allows civil disobedience simply because a law is disliked. You cannot break the law with God's blessing just because you're inconvenienced. Disagreement with the law is not, is not a biblical blessing to disobey. Americans are free to disagree, but not in the name of God. So, not paying your taxes just because you disagree with how your government spends them is just as bad as not paying your tithes because you don't like the color of the carpet in the church. Number five, I said four, I was wrong, I was mistaken, there's five. (laughs) Five, fifth principle for practice, uh, for uh, convictions guiding civil disobedience. Religious persecution is a sign pointing to the end. One of the reasons why I feel so impressed, I, I mean, I'm literally shaking in adrenaline, anointing this morning because I feel so impressed by God that we are getting so close to the end, friend. And I know my grandma and my grandpa died saying Jesus is coming soon, but we can see the signs happening all around us today. And religious persecution is a sign pointing to the end. We should get used to it. The closer we get to the end, the more we Christians will be persecuted and subjected to laws that violate the supreme laws of God. It will happen more and more. And for those watching today via live stream, those of you who are in this room listening today, if the government commands it, we should unquestionably obey it if you hold that conviction our government is good and if they command it we should just do it no matter what it says i would respond if you hold that belief then perhaps you should get saved (laughs) 
Whoa, that's a bold statement, Pastor Barry. Well, Scripture predicts that this will happen with more and more frequency. It's a sign that the end is near. I want to read Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 through 14 on the multimedia display. Who is speaking here? Jesus. He says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then, and then, and then, and then the end will come. As we see the end approach, Jesus gives two commands. Let me just, two commands in this particular scripture. Two commands as we see the end approach. Number one, stand firm to the end. By the way, only those who stand firm will be saved. Many will turn away. Uh, uh, I thought you couldn't lose your salvation, Pastor Barry. Well, mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. perhaps they were never saved, I guess, whatever. Many will turn away from the faith. Their love will stand firm to the end. You'll be saved. And take the gospel to the end of the earth. This gospel. That's what Jesus says. As you see the the end, as you see us getting closer and closer to the end, two things you must do. Stand firm to the end and take the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. Someone might say to me, Pastor Barry, do you think it's realistic to have global impact Sunday next week during the pandemic? Yes. We must stand firm to the end. And we must preach the gospel to the end of the earth. That's Jesus' command. Stand firm and do missions. Stand firm and do missions. When I was, doing, when I was preparing this message, God gave me a prophetic word, so I just want to speak prophecy. I want to speak this prophetically to you this morning. There is going to be a time real soon when you will have to make a choice. Am I an American or am I a disciple of Jesus? We're not there yet. I don't believe we're there yet. But I warn you, I prophesy to you, I plead with you, pray hard because there's coming a time very soon. I pray God bless America. I'm patriotic. I, I mean it. I love the country I'm living in, but just as much as I love America, I know we're coming to a crossroads where before Jesus comes, I'm going to have to make a choice. Am I an American or am I a follower of Jesus? God forbid that we have to do that. But there's a time coming. I don't think we're there, but the tipping point is coming. All right, those are some five principles, I think, that should guide our convictions about civil disobedience. Let me conclude this morning by giving you some practicals. <laughs> Practicing biblical c c civil disobedience. <laughs> Boy, that's a mouthful. Practicing biblical civil disobedience. See, this list, just like the other, is by no means exhaustive, but I want to give you some instruction and boundaries that should guide our practice of civil disobedience when it becomes necessary. Okay? Some practicals. First and foremost, number one, Christians are urged to pray for our leaders. Can I just say this? We should never disobey a leader or a law until we have prayed for our leader. 
First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Paul urges his young protege, I urge then, first of all, that petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and, and quiet lives in all godless, godliness and holiness. See, friends, listen to me. We are facing one of the most contentious elections in all of history. You see it coming. It's headed like a train wreck. And so let me ask people of God in this room and watching by stream, let me ask you a question. Answer this in your spirit this morning. Will you pray for a leader you didn't vote for? The fact is, our only hope is prayer. And I'm calling this church to pray. And when I found out about the return, when I found out about a prayer intercessory meeting that's going to happen on September 26th, the return, a global day of repentance and prayer, when I found out about, about that, I said, we're in. And I want to ask you to find some time on that day. It's a Saturday. Find some time. Pastor Duane is heading up this project. Pastor, uh, Pastor Michael, our prayer... Uh, pastor, we're, we're, we're cooperating in this. Help us. Let's be people of prayer. I'm calling on you to find time in your day. There is a internet feed that we will be tapped into. There's a prayer gathering in Washington, D.C. I'm hoping to actually may even be there in person, depending on if they let me get on the train. <laughs> I want us to pray. We need to pray like never before. And if the world slips and the tipping point happens and we regret that we did not pray during this time of crisis, we may regret it. Christians are urged to pray for our leaders. The first thing you can do, pray. Number two, practicing biblical civil disobedience, we should resist a government that commands and compels evil. We should resist a government that commands or compels evil. Let me say this. Abortion is a huge issue for me. And it will be a huge factor in my vote coming this November. Now I confess. Let me say this and be honest. And you might get mad at me over this. So be it. I don't like either candidate for president. I don't. I don't. So please don't email me and tell me how great Trump is. Please don't call me and tell me how great Biden is. I don't like either of them. But when our nation kills unborn babies by the millions, that's evil, and I must resist that. If my government ever compels me to hire people at this church that practice evil, if my government ever commands me to not speak out against what God speaks out against, I'll not only resist, I'll disobey. And I'll say, come and get me, and you better make a pretty big prison jumpsuit because I wear a triple XL. Number three, we must disobey a leader or a law that is in direct violation of God's law and commands. Just like the apostles who were commanded to not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, if the practice of evangelical Christianity in America is declared illegal, I'll find a way to disobey. I will find a way. Just like Peter and John did. Because the underground church has flourished elsewhere in the world, and I've seen it firsthand in China and in other places where it's against the law to openly preach the gospel. I've seen the underground church flourish. Now, I don't want to give up so easily 
But if you tell me I can lose my tax-exempt status if I preach against certain behaviors, take it. I must obey God rather than man. God is my supreme authority. Try to cancel him. Number four. If we practice civil civil disobedience, we must be willing to pay the price or punishment for that disobedience. This is the bad news. There's some churches in California today who are going to be fined thousands of dollars for disobeying the civil government. This is the caveat. If we disobey, we might need to pay. (laughs) If you disobey, you might need to pay. (laughs) So let me ask you a question. How far are you willing to go for God? How much is too much to pay for obedience to God over man? I love how Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah responded to the death threat of an evil leader. And I'll put it on the screen again. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. King Nebuchadnezzar, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We're willing to die for this principle. If we practice civil disobedience, we must be willing to pay the price or punishment for that disobedience. Number five, I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to, let's get out of here quick. I'm going to run in my office and hide. We should work legally and nonviolently to install a new government. If, If we're subjected to laws that violate God, we should do everything in our power, everything legally and non-violently to install a new government. First of all, register and vote. I, I don't think you can complain if you don't vote. You gotta vote. Secondly, don't be afraid to speak out. Call or write or email your government officials. Call or write them. Can I tell you, I I have all of my government officials, I have them on my contact list, and when something comes up, I'm sending out an email. And you know what? Never once, even with senators that were not on the side of the issues that I am on, I get replies from all of them. They're listening. We need to speak up. We need to speak up. Don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid of being canceled. Now, I I hope I haven't offended you. I've tried to be very biblical. (laughs) It's a reality I think we're coming. I don't want you to stand in the presence of God ever and say, no one ever told me about this. Because now you know. So let me leave this series with a reminder of Jesus' command at the end. Stand firm to the end. Take the gospel to the end of the earth. The church must not be canceled. The gospel, the saving, redeeming power of God to transform lives cannot be canceled. So we must not be silent. We must stand firm. And we must take the gospel to the end of the earth. Will you stand with me this morning? I asked Pastor Emily if she would lead us one more time in the chorus we sang earlier. I want us to leave this series and I want us to leave this message this morning. And let me just say, let me look you right in the eye and say, If you can't stand in the presence of these people of faith and make this affirmation, how are you going to stand in the presence of a government that is opposed to Christianity if you have to? If you can't stand in the presence of people of faith and take a stand and make a declaration for God, how can you do it elsewhere? So here's what I would like to do. I would like us to end by singing. I'm going to lead in prayer, and I want us to sing 
the song. We'll have the elders and deacons come after this. Who is our supreme authority? There are subordinate authorities, and there's the supreme authority. And I want to ask you this morning as we leave this series to make a commitment. I don't care about being canceled. I'm going to follow the teachings and the leading of the supreme authority in my life, and that's Jesus Christ. I'll give to Caesar what is Caesar, but I'm going to give to God what is God's. And he is owed by me my supreme allegiance. And so I'm going to ask you just to make some sort of a step this morning. I I would like us to step forward as we sing this. I will bow at your feet, Lord Jesus. I will not bow to the feet of government. I bow to the feet of Jesus. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And let me tell you something, friends. If we ever have to stand against, we don't now, But if we ever have to stand against in disobedience to a government, it's going to be vital that we understand how wonderful and pleasant and pleasurable it is to be in the presence of God. So before we leave this series, I'm going to ask you some way. You don't have to come all the way up. You don't have to violate social distance and spread out. Maybe just step out, step forward, something. I want you to do something physical. You say, yeah, but people are watching. Oh, yeah. Hmm. They are. They always are. But I'm going to bow my knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords, supreme authority. Pastor Emily, will you lead us in that? And if you're willing to make that declaration this morning before we pray and dismiss this service, come take a step forward. Let's be socially aware of distancing. Go ahead. (laughs) 